Okay, so now we have uh, Zaki Mannion from Cosmos. Uh, but in case you didn't notice already, we sent out the airdrop coins. So if you check your wallet, you should have 0.0015 Bitcoins. <laughs> Bizarre. Okay, everyone, uh, I think we're going to get started now. Uh, so please welcome Zaki to talk about all things Cosmos. So, hi everyone. Um, this is a talk that uh, I've probably been wanting to give for three years, and it's also probably a talk that does not explain what Cosmos is. Um, if you don't know what Cosmos is, go to cosmos.network, and we finally, after three years, have a fairly legible explanation about what Cosmos is. Um, also, Cosmos is launching imminently. Um, when I was prepping this talk, it was unclear whether or not we would have launched by the time I gave it, or whether or not we would have announced launch, or whether or not you know launch would be like a week away. The scenario that we ended up with is we're kind of on the order of like a week until mainnet launch, um, but like imminent uh, software risk is zero, uh, is like or as at least as low as I can make it. So we're going to have a mainnet soon, um, and it's it's sort of interesting. What I want this talk, to, what this talk is about is a little bit of design thinking um, that went into developing Cosmos um, and sort of the tension that I see as like, you know, a multiple time startup founder um, between like how we develop blockchain protocols, how we fund them, the like the ICO funding mechanism and like the basic principles that make building like a new company, a new organization, uh, a new product successful. Um, and sort of how uh, we tried to resolve these tensions in Cosmos. And at this point, I can sort of, I think, persuasively argue that our approach worked. Um, so I have that to go on. Okay, so yes, uh, roughly next week, um, like almost five years ago, Jay Kwan came up with the idea of building a BFT consensus network system uh, for blockchains based on like classical BFT computer science research. Um, like the original ideas behind Cosmos are almost that, that long, that old. Um, three years, like two years later, so three years ago, uh, Jay, Ethan, and I sort of started sketching out uh, the ideas of Cosmos on a whiteboard, um, and here we are today. So by no stretch of the imagination is this like a fast or like a fast process. This is not a fast product dev development cycle. I mean, in the world of startups taking five years from sort of uh, 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 idea to MVP is like, is slightly absurd. Um, it, it certainly isn't, uh, 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 it, and it like, you know, to a, to a large extent, I have to credit Jay with like seeing something that needed to be built so far along, so far ago, so long ago, sticking with it over five years, like putting an enormous amount of effort into it. And largely it wasn't until even like three years ago or like two years ago that anyone even really recognized that this would possibly be a good idea. Um, and so, okay, so like conviction is important. Uh, we bit like product development cycles are long, but also we need to figure out how to build things um, uh, that people will actually want to use. And when you are building over such long timescales, um, and you and now with sort of the ICO funding mechanism, you end up with uh, uh, sort of financial runways that allow you to build over years. Um, how do you end up with something that anyone actually wants to use? So. What we've more or less produced at Cosmos is a series of public goods. Um, and you can think of each of these public goods as kind of a product that built upon itself um, and that we were able to get some signal of product market fit uh, when we released it um, before we built sort of the next layer. Um, so the first layer was the Tendermint consensus engine. Uh, the Tendermint consensus engine has been sort of available for commercial use since 2015. It's been reasonably good at it. Um, it's sort of been like formally BFT since about 2017. Um, 
And at this point, it's the only like classical BFT engine that's ever been run by strangers over the public internet, um, and not just like a single system administrator in a data center. Um, so then we built the Cosmos SDK, which was the first framework for building sort of blockchains. Then we built uh, uh, like the incentivization, coordination, and punishment framework that we call bonded proof of stake. Um, on top of that, then we launched a series of test nets, um, and that built our community of validators, which is also sort of part of the product. Um, and now we have like, we believe a network that is um, sort of robust enough to custody real assets, um, a technology stack that is doing that. And not only is the Cosmos uh, uh, mainnet going to custody those assets, but there are a number of other people who use, uh, like Loom for instance, uh, who use parts of this stack to custody real assets. So the basic philosophy was take the vision, the vision of a boundlessly scalable connected sequence of blockchains, break it down into independent public goods, release those public goods in the market, figure out, like observe adoption and use of those public goods, and then have that be a feedback cycle into the development process. And to a large extent, we are the only project that I think has done this. Um, every other project has released largely a fully integrated stack to the extent that they've released anything, and or they've released bits and pieces that are kind of not standalone useful. Um, and I would say that this has been a mistake. And our primary proof point for this is the ecosystem that exists around Cosmos pre-mainnet launch. Um, obviously, the flagship thing, which basically was not a business development win, it mostly fell out of the sky, um, was Binance Chain. Um, we also have high-profile projects that aren't on this slide, like the Thailand National ID system is building on top of Tendermint. Um, there are, there's like a large foreign exchange player who's been using Tendermint in production since 2016. Um, like we have, we have like a fairly large uh, user base um, of people who are building interesting stuff. Um, and that's mostly the value here. Like the value is we produce these public goods and they are useful to people and we know they are useful to people because we are not paying any of these people to build on top of us. Um, so this is just some more examples. Like all of these people are awesome. We've also like recruited this awesome network of people who were largely strangers to us on the internet, who who like are who like uh, have built you know businesses and invested large amounts of their own time and money into learning the skills to operate our software, um, and have built businesses around operating our software. Uh, we just finished this sort of large-scale competitive test net called Game of Stakes um, that, was, that was the, uh, um, that was what the, uh, that was uh, the first competitive test net with like a BFT consensus protocol to test whether or not the incentivization layer worked. Uh, we saw Sybil attacks and, uh, uh, and denial of service attacks, transaction spam attacks, nodes crashed, like it was awesome. Um, but again, this is the value of, I think, the approach that we took. I think all throughout this process, there has been like a sort of, uh, uh, in the, like, uh, uh, in the sort of popular culture of blockchains, there was kind of like always this perception that maybe Cosmos over-promised and under-delivered. Um, but like, as you, I think, persuasively argue from the last couple of slides, that the reality has been that by releasing like sort of the minimum useful version of every level or layer of our stack, we added something that was incredibly useful to the blockchain ecosystem and allowed people to build like better, more useful systems on top of it. Um, so, yeah, this is working. Um, you know, we started out with this like large, expansive vision. That vision is not going to be complete for many years to come. Uh, we're at best at the midway point of trying to deliver this system, but we have de-risked the actual execution enormously. Um, 
And like, so there's this like fundamental tension, which is we are trying to build public infrastructure that will last decades. And you don't build public infrastructure that will last decades by like starting from the rickety bridge and then iterating on it until you get to the like fully like th thought out thing that lasts 100 years. Um, and that's true. And you can't fundraise in this space by telling people you're going to build the rickety bridge. Um, but on the other hand, if you don't ship anything, um, you don't actually know whether or not what you're building is useful. Um, I think the other reason why blockchains, um, like why you have to sort of incorporate some of these ideas of like ship early, ship often into like blockchain development is that while we fund blockchains like public infrastructure projects, operationally blockchains are startup companies. Um, and the biggest risk to startup companies are usually not technical, they're operational. Um, and there's always been this uh, 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 sort of like truism about building startups, which is like you ship your org chart. And if you never ship, you never build an org chart that ships. Um, and this is like a massive, massive tension within the, the, the sort of current blockchain landscape as I see it, which is if you do not build a culture of putting something out on a regular basis, you are not going to learn how to put out, put out stuff on a regular basis. You can generate all the like, phenomenal research papers in the world, but there will never be any engineering artifacts um, that people can use. So, like pervasively in the blockchain space right now, I see a, like especially among the layer one protocols, I see like numerous pathologies. Like so, there's something that like has been called second sy system syndrome, which is the second version of every project um, tries to fix all of the problems of the previous project. So essentially, every layer one program protocol is a second system for Ethereum, um, and they all try to fix every single problem with Ethereum. Um, and in the history of like building computers, this has always been a disaster, and I worry that it like we are continuing to build a disaster. And like the explicit design of the Cosmos release cycle was to avoid this. Um, and when you are building a second system, and then you and you try to fix all of the problems of Ethereum at the same time, you end up with a system that you are unclear whether or not like users at the moment when you reach release your system are actually going to use your system. Um, and so market feedback is important. So somehow you have to resolve these these tensions. This approach that we took with Cosmos like did that, and I think is like largely why we are shipping a project today. So our design principles all along have been the minute the software like, is safe and can be used for a thing, get it in the hands of users. Um, don't try to make it perfect. Don't try to make it uh, uh, as fancy and do all the bells and whistles as possible. Just ship the th goddamn thing. Um, the second piece is almost every component of the Cosmos ecosystem is independently useful. You can use it for building things as part of Cosmos. You can use it for building other architectures. Um, if the whole Cosmos like vision doesn't work out, largely these pieces of software will still be useful. So that's sort of my a little bit of my rant, but it's also just like three years of frustration kind of boiling over. Um, <laughs> Um, like, yeah, it was, you know, Cosmos is designed to fix the problems of the Gen 1 system that is Ethereum. Um, it is designed to be a system of, like, programmable BFT computers that can handle financial assets and, like, operate at the scale of the global financial market. But we actually managed to, sh to like, build that or, you know, in the process of actually shipping all of the little bits and pieces as we went. Um, and so, like, this is a model that works. If you are thinking about building one of these systems, like, do it this way is, would be my recommendation. Um, and don't do the other thing, which is 
um, spend five years like building your cathedral and then dropping it on the world. So um, after that, I'll take questions. And if we don't have to talk about this in questions. If people have questions about Cosmos, Cosmos Launch, all that stuff, I have seven minutes to answer them. So I'm happy to talk about any of that. Thanks so much, Saki. Hey, so uh, I was curious if during this process of shipping, like what was an instance in which you, you guys, after shipping something, realized like, oh, the design of the cathedral was wrong and was it difficult now that it was already in people's hands to kind of go back on some of that? Um, so, I mean, we're like, you know, Cosmos had a reputation of like, we were like two months from launch for 14 months. Uh, <laughs> um, now, like, I, I was telling people, like, a month ago, this is the first time we're a month from launch, and now we're, like, a week from launch. Um, so, like, for the first time, the, the timelines have collapsed. But why were we, f like, 14 months, like, two months from launch for 14 months is because, like, we didn't fully understand all the requirements. Um, and it was only from putting the software in people's hands and, like, seeing the system operate at scale and thinking about it that we, like, learned what the requirements, especially at the incentivization layer, really were. Um, and so that's, that's why we like, why this took a long time, but why it was the right thing to do to like keep shipping test nets um, and keep like getting people involved in the test nets and keep seeing the test nets break. Because we actually learned what the requirements were. So sorry, to clarify, when you say test nets, do you mean that there were multiple instances in which you basically said, all right, we're throwing out the old one, here's a new one, totally new state. Yeah, many, 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 many. We I, were, I think we're at like, probably like the 17th full state reset um, is, the, is the current release candidate. Um, so yeah, but like totally, totally worth it. Cool, thank you. So I really appreciate what you said about second systems. Um, so I want to like go back in time when I was just focused on internet security research. And when I was starting my PhD in 2005, um, there was a lot of work at that time on replacing the internet, so clean slate internet design. I don't know if you remember this period. And so there was like massive amounts of National Science Foundation money on clean slate internet. Design. I was an undergrad then. So. Okay, good. So <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. And I never wanted to work on that stuff because I never thought that the internet would be replaced by this new internet that we were going to to all be building. And if you can see what happened to all of that work, like very actually interestingly, very little of it has even been, you know, used in, in the internet at the end of the day. So so I, I really appreciate your whole pathology about second system. So my question for you, since you've obviously thought about this a lot, you know, when do you think we are going to have the system and we're going to stop having the second system, right? So if the first system is Ethereum, now we and have like the Ethereum generation. will fail okay. in its current form. So we That's can all just like be scientists and understand that. Okay. So so when are we going to like you know right now we have lots of extremely well funded layer one projects, really interesting technology behind all of them. When are we going to see? The winner, is there going to be a winner? Like, when do we stop? Um, like, I, I, I mean, like, there will clearly be a stopping point. Like, like layer one innovation will eventually stop being interesting. Um, and uh, I, like, mostly what Cosmos is trying to do is introduce some new, like, architectural elements about how different like sort of layer one projects like interact with each other to sort of make it a little easier to bootstrap new layer ones um, so that by like giving the, the so they because they could like source their assets externally um, to to kind of like make the innovation happen fast and then like settle down um, so like my whole goal with like building this system was to sort of accelerate getting to that stability point. Like obviously had no idea in 2016 about like the amount of money that would be unleashed on, on like building new layer one systems. Um, it was like shocking to us that we got enough money to build this. Um, but uh, it'll, it will eventually settle down and like it'll be over and like my, my life will be less like, or at least like this aspect of my skill set will no longer be valuable. Like how to build a layer one blockchain. Hey, so uh, in your methodology, one of the things you talk about is getting product in people's hands gives you unexpected results. Uh, with mainnet launching next week, what is a, an ex unexpected application that all of us should be watching for 
that people are shipping that you know might not be on our radar like Binance Dex? Um, I don't think people realize the extent to which things like um, like Oasis um, are part of the Cosmos vision. Like they sort of like fundraised and everything, but they're just like everything built on Tendermint. I suspect is just going to come to Cosmos. Um, they're going to come to Cosmos because like once you're built on Tendermint, it's really easy. And the minute someone else ships everything, something else BFT, it'll also just end up in this architecture. Like there's going to be a lot like a lot of things that people think have nothing to do with Cosmos will end up being just like components of Cosmos. Um, uh, is sort of what I think will happen. Uh. And, and with that, the existing applications that you've talked to porting over, what, what do you think are good early cases there? Um, I'm kind of obsessed with BFT price feeds right now. I think we talked about this, but um, yeah, like I think that's like a huge application. Obviously, like, you know, when we started out, we were like, oh, there should be a DEX, but hopefully Binance is going to take care of that for us. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I'm just I'm excited about like all the other things that people will build because I've been mostly thinking about how to like ship the basic la base layer of this thing. So very excited. Thank you very much. Thanks, Aki.